View from the Gutters, episode 139. Welcome to View from the Gutters, the comic book podcast where each episode we discuss a collected edition, trade paperback, or graphic novel, and then recommend and vote on the book for the next episode. Warning. The discussion portion of this show has massive spoilers for that book. On this episode, we discuss Michael Moorcock's Elric of Meldebone. And, to skip ahead to the recommendation section, skip to 115.40. Uh, did you guys want to start? Yeah, I, I guess really I'm really ready. No? Okay, am... V from the Gutters, episode 139, I'm Andrew Chard. I'm Tobias Panchin. I'm Kaylee Fleeman. And I'm Joe Pretty. No. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome no, to the show, you're, Joe. No. You're specifically not Joe Pretty. that's and the I'm entire point. And I'm anything but Joe Pretty. Um... My name is Kit DeForge. Joe Preddy is... We had to make up something new each Joe time, right? Joe has... No, this is mine. Okay. You don't take your I had something prepared okay. for this. Okay, I don't care. Um, <laughs> Joe Preddy is Call currently <laughs> brokering a deal between um, the Dark Prince and Earth to uh-huh. keep everything revolving and the soul flow going evenly. Uh, he will be back at some other point. Flow. Yeah, soul flow I want to make up something like it would new. Be each- like a sweet R and B band. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out the way you deal with the devil is with sweet R and B. Oh yeah. yeah, just ask How, Joe. Well, I I thought you did it with like old timey like fiddle playing. No, oh, this is why no. we send this is Joe the to new do and this. modern <laughs> devil. <laughs> Joe understands. Yeah, yeah. The uh, like, fiddle's okay, but you can really only take so much. Yeah, so so the the short and true version of that for anyone who's curious, Joe is taking an an indefinite hiatus from the show, uh, and in exchange, we have Kit, who will be joining us as a new permanent host of the show. Hooray! Nice. So Cinnamon roll. I I really feel like we've traded up in that regard. And Hooray for Earth! Welcome to the show, <laughs> Kit. Yeah, welcome me. <laughs> I'm still not Joe Pretty. How does so, it we'll feel see. to have won this chair over thousands of applicants who applied? I really think of it more as assuming a throne that was always mine. Oh. Um, I feel like I pulled the puppet strings. Oh, I see. And made you all dance for long enough, and. Um, yeah, you know, can, maybe you uh, you convinced someone to use dragons in a oh. battle in which they weren't necessary, <laughs> nah, so that really. they were like too tired to then go into battle later. I'm, you convinced mm, Joe uh, to I'm not really into move dragons, his really. boats out into the deep ocean in which you could push him figuratively overboard in his armor. To, to me, Joe's blood is weak and frail. Right. <laughs> um, with comparison, well, we all know that <laughs> to mine. Yes. So I was like, mm, that guy's kind of an albino. Get him out of here. <laughs> get, get that albino. <laughs> yeah. Baby. So uh, that's what that happened. Beautiful, beautiful albino, man. True animal fact. Why would we lie about this? No. Um, we wouldn't. Uh, and before we get started, real quick, uh, a shout out to our Patreon episode sponsors. Shout out. Thank you to Brian May, Brandon Hill, Addison Appleby, and Becca Lewandowski. Yeah, I saw a picture of Addison Appleby's corgis today. Yeah. And I just got, like, way too excited. She about... has the cutest corgis. Yeah. They are so adorable. Yeah. Uh, Sheldon and Winston, yeah. they are the, the kings of corgidom. Yeah. She she actually borrows her mother's corgi sometimes, Lily. And at that moment, she ascends to become the corgi Lisi. As th- with three corgis. With three corgis. Is that? Wow. I- Damn. <laughs> they are beautiful. And I do love a, a She's a one away corgi. from having a chariot. She yes. could totally have a corgi chariot. Just it needs to uh, steal Benson. That's exactly it. Don't mm-hmm. think she hasn't threatened. <laughs> and without that Joe is absolutely on off. the table. Yeah. Yeah. No, that sounds good. Any chariot pulled by corgis is a ultimate weapon of war. Well, mm-hmm. it's too, too strong, if strong for count this world. Benson, we only need one more to make Corgi Avengers. Yeah. Which is a fantastic... If you haven't seen Corgi Avengers, go online and there's like a woman dressed up as Nick Fury and like all five of her corgis are in Avengers <laughs> costumes and it is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Absolutely. Um, but in other news, uh, we're talking about comics we are. this week mm-hmm. and not just corgis. Um, <laughs> why Why are we not talking about corgi comics? Well, I said not just corgi. Oh, oh okay. we could talk about... Does anyone know any corgi comics? Uh... What's that I one? I know there's got there well um oh crap. There's that one that just 
I recommended it on the show. I can't remember the name of it. Man, I don't even the, know. The corgi, he names this dog. I think it's a corgi. He names the dog after like a writer that he liked. So the name of the book is the name of that writer, but it's in reference oh, to the dog. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. yeah. I oh, I no cannot idea. think of it, though. The only thing I can think of is uh, Hope Corgi, which is like the Blue Lantern Corgi fan creation <laughs> as a counterpoint to the Red Lantern cat. The cat? Nice. Yeah. That's yeah. excellent. I I think that's appropriate. Um, but, but yeah, no, we're, we're we're talking about Elric. Yeah. Of Melnabone. Of Melnabone. Issues one through six. Yeah. And you pitched the book, Jar. I did. What are your thoughts on it? Uh, well, I love it. Um, it has some issues, which we'll get to. I have some some qualms some about misgivings. it. Some, some things that I'm like, eh, I don't know. But as, like, as far as feel and scale and mood, this comic does a lot for me in terms of fantasy comics. And I feel like there's not enough fantasy comics out there in the world. It's like an underrepresented genre in the world of comic books. It used to be huge, and I feel like this comic... It came out in 82, was kind of on the tail end of when sword and sorcery and fantasy comics were like Yeah, well, I, I think the that there was, a, there was a huge fantasy movement, both in literature and in comic books, that kind of ran throughout the 70s and petered out yeah. in like, I want to say like the late 80s and early 90s. Yeah, I would say that. Um, and that there there was an entire I think subgenre of of fantasy comics like this and Elf Quest that was kind of running throughout that period that has a lot of um, a lot of kind of the same themes and ideas running through them. And yeah. there were a number of things that I saw here where I'm like that this feels very similar to Elf Quest. One of my first introductions to elves and fantasy that were not Lord of the Rings elves were. Um, from novels and short stories written about the tabletop war game, Mm -hmm. uh, Warhammer, Mm -hmm. and the high elves in Warhammer Fantasy are really heavily based on these elves, as far as I know, because they ride dragons, and they live on an island that's separated from everyone, it's kind of like the end of their reign, Mm -hmm. their gods Mm -hmm. are dying, like, they definitely drew a lot of influence from stuff like this. Well, the whole thing in Warhammer with uh, chaos and the lords of chaos is straight out of Elric of Melibone. Yeah. Like, just lifted entirely. Yeah. Um... And so, that was an 80s creation. Yeah. Fantasy. Like, like there's no beating around the bush. Warhammer just, like, stole everything from everybody. Well, just like D&D did at its beginning. And it's there's like, a reason. It's not anything unique about that. No. And there's a good reason why Warhammer kind of borrowed so much from everything. Warhammer is a game. Uh, not to talk about Warhammer in this entire podcast, but yeah. um, it's what this reminded me of. Warhammer is a game. They started as Citadel Miniatures, which was a mm-hmm. miniatures company, which they didn't have a game. They just made fantasy miniatures. So they made fantasy miniatures about stuff they liked. So they made like minis for D&D. They made minis for other role, tabletop role-playing game. They made the Lords of Chaos miniatures, and they made all this stuff. Then they realized that there were people out there in the world that had massive collections of their miniatures and nothing really to do with them. And that's when they came up with the tabletop wargaming rules that were like, you can put them in regiments, and these guys have this rule. And they did that as a service to their fans who had like bought a bunch of their stuff. So that being said, they had already made all these miniatures like that were based on fantasy novels that they loved, so that kind of just like crept into the way the, the tabletop games lore and mythos grew up. Um, but that was my first introduction to elves outside of lord of the rings and i really like the idea of these elves that are like similar to the lord like of the this, rings this ancient and decrepit race yeah. that's kind of like past their prime and they've fallen into hedonism yeah and they're like they just sit in their empire and don't do anything yeah and i feel I and mean, i feel like this is kind of the it's not really a counterpoint, but maybe a continuation of the ideas that Tolkien put forward about elves and uh, their separation from mankind as they left to the Grey Isles, you know, as they, like, ran away from Middle-earth. Like, what would become of them mm-hmm. at that point? And if they have been separate for so long, like, what are they like? And what does the world feel about them? Because when the barbarians show up and they're like, you're a threat to us just by existing, like, you know things you shouldn't know. You have things you shouldn't have. 
you're old and scary, and so mm-hmm. we'll always have to fight you. Like, it doesn't matter if you have treasure or not, we're going to show up. Um, I really like that confrontation between Elric and the, like, King of the Barbarians before he chops his head off. And it's yeah, like, totally. And it's, hey, a, it's a shame that, and killed me. that Brant isn't here for this episode because I feel like he really knows the most about sort of that 70s period of mm. fantasy than any of us. Uh, and this really is part and parcel with what was going on in fantasy in the 70s. There was a lot of like strange psychic powers and old gods and decaying civilizations. I think it was very much kind of the mood of the period. Well, you have guys like, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, wrote Conan. Um, oh, um, Edgar Rice Burroughs. Thank you. Uh, who, like a lot of the old gods, I think like Cthulhu and that kind of stuff, like he was um, kind of one of the progenitors of, of those old yeah, gods. Absolutely. And so a lot of that, like ancient wizardry and magic that people don't understand uh, found its way into Conan and then into all yeah, sorts well, of fantasy. Back in the 30s, um, <clears throat> science was discovering that both human civilization and the universe in general is a lot older mm. than they initially thought it was. Because, you know, for a long time, Western science or religion or what have you it's like mm-hmm. oh the world it's like six thousand years old yeah and even if you didn't buy into that you're like oh well maybe it's you know 30 Ten, 40 yeah. thousand years old and they were starting to dig up like fossils of dinosaurs <clears throat> that were millions of years old and actually like starting to carbon date rocks and be like oh the earth is actually like billions of years old and they yeah. were starting to build telescopes that were good enough that they could see not only our own galaxy but realizing that there were other galaxies out there, yeah, which is not something that anybody had ever considered before. And there was kind of this freak out of like, oh my God, the universe is so old and so vast and so antithetical to human life. Like mm-hmm. what other things are there out there? Yeah. And I think that that was a big freak out of Lovecraft's. And I think that it sort of communicated into what was being written in the seventies where there was this sort of, I, this sense that American civilization was declining Mm. and we had all these examples by then of all these civilizations that had collapsed into the ash can of history and Mm -hmm. this feeling that we were inevitably heading to that same sort of decline. Mm -hmm. And I think it came out in writing like Elric, Mm -hmm. like you can really, really see that. that Yeah. Elric is at the end of this book, he's like, I have to figure out if there's anything that we can learn from the young races. Otherwise, I don't think our civilization will survive. Absolutely. And I think you see a growth in him from the beginning where he's like languidly, like he's like kind of like sprawled out on his throne. Like, this is what we do. I'm on the Ruby throne. I just kind of got to hang out here. I don't really want to do anything. And at the end, he finally has purpose. And Mm -hmm. I think that that's a cool story. But I also think it kind of is the whole like, anti-old establishment writing that they're like, you know, when people get too comfortable with the way things are, you start to have a lot of infighting and bickering and betrayal and backstabbing and there's Mm -hmm. no pursuit of knowledge. And I like that Elric is, he's a reader, he's a scholar, he's a kind of like a a wise, like philosopher king kind of ideal. Sort Sort of. of. I mean, he has problems. When you look at Melnabone, there is no pretending that the civilization is in any way good or righteous. Not at the beginning. Not now. No. No. I mean, he he has a court torturer. Like, they do blood rituals where they sacrifice like, oh, the the emperor's getting married. We have to kill seven newlywed couples. But his father ended a lot of that. Yes, that's true. And then there are... suffered for it, supposedly. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I like supposedly. that. I like that, like, he's breaking the old tradition. No, we got to go back to the way things yeah, were. Like their old well, because look how your like, son came out. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, their old tradition was demon worship. Mm-hmm. Like, the Lords of Chaos are not good gods. No, I mean, they're not... They're, they're good. I mean, they're not good in that they are, like, not... They're not bestowing, like, blessings upon people right. or whatever. But they're still awesome, and uh, they are good. <laughs> If power is the good, yeah. power is the focus of morality, then cool that's, stuff. you know, that's the good. One of them transforms into a Jeff Goldblum fly man, yeah. which is fucking awesome. And that unfortunately, not actually Jeff Goldblum, which I'm in the movie, slammed the book shut. In the, uh, 
in the cinematic movie version of this, I was writing in my head. That's definitely Jeff Goldblum. Well, Bless. If, if, you look at, if you look at his like golden god form, yeah. like, if you just repainted that, it uh-huh. would look like Jeff Goldblum. Yeah, I think so too. Life finds a way. Yeah. Life uh, 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 finds, finds a way. way. <laughs> I love Jeff Goldblum. So like, speaking of long pauses, Jesus Christ, the fucking ellipses in this book. I oh swear god. to God. Oh my God. Okay, so this. Dramatic pause. This was my first time reading this book. Um, so I don't have a lot of the same affection for it. In fact, my review was probably, like, if I was just left to my own devices, it would just be me screaming for an hour. Um, I did not have a lot of fond things about this book, particularly starting out towards the end of it, reflecting upon it. It's like, okay, that wasn't as bad. But I definitely wouldn't recommend this to somebody unless it was with the stipulation of hey you're interested in learning about like fantasy and kind of the history of fantasy and of that genre you should check this out because reading it as somebody who wants to be entertained or who some as somebody who wants to read a good comic I did not feel that. You didn't like the family drama and the backstabbing? No. And the, really? I mean, so... Don't forget the incest. The story well, itself wasn't... I mean, that's wasn't, important for every story. Wasn't terrible. Like, it was a strong it story. Is, it is, yeah. Um, it was definitely a strong story. And I I appreciated a lot more about it than I thought I would. Um, Kit was there last night when I downloaded this and started looking through it and i pretty much just kept pointing to my computer and screaming what is this shit yeah um Yeah. (laughs) um, so i finishing it it's like okay that was a satisfying ending but i just i don't really care for the art I don't. It, I don't it's like. It's definitely done in a much older style that's a lot <laughs> harder to appreciate. Yeah, compared oh, to sure. modern. Like, yeah. it does things mm. very differently. Modern comics are very sparse. They let the art really do a lot of the walking. This thing is littered with narration boxes. Oh my yeah, god! And that narrating... is my biggest problem with this whole yeah. book is the fact that if this is supposed to be an adaptation then maybe you should give it a chance to be the visual medium that it is instead yeah. of just like weighing it down with text, which like I'm fine with lots of text and things. But my problem is you can either emulate the way somebody writes and then just like, you know, lean, you can lean heavy on that. That's okay. But I feel like if you're making a graphic novel or if you're making a comic, maybe you should give it a chance to be a comic. Oh, and a and that's bit. the thing. Like they're, not even really adapting it it's more like an illustrated novel yeah and they like even to the point where it's like narration box he smiled illustration yeah, yeah. Smiling. And that, like that is completely but unnecessary. i feel like there's also yeah. a lot of times where there are narration boxes over a large there's like um i'm flipping rapidly through this in the first issue they're like setting the stage of mal bone and there's like and then there are bear bear there were barbarian raids and then it like has like a bunch of caption boxes that are not necessarily related to the barbarian raids Mm -hmm. but you have this full page spread of just like an awesome battle going on in the background between all this stuff and it's like you imagine this as narration over a visual medium of a montage i mean this is an entire novel in six issues yeah Mm -hmm. they had to jam the like I guess my two counter arguments to what you're saying is one, they had a lot of fucking information to a part in you and it could have been a lot worse. Like the, the, I found like the narration boxes were as minimal as they needed to be. Like there, there's enough information imparted into you, but I never felt like I was like, and I'm wading through a 15 page. Like this isn't a Bendis comic. I, right? yeah, like, I, okay, so I didn't, that way at times. I didn't quite feel that way, but it felt, It felt unnecessary because so much of the narration in the narration boxes was just describing what was physically happening and not trimming the wrong thing. And my second argument, like like that, is the way that comics used to be done. If you read Silver Age comics, like Spider Man, Stanley is literally just narrating what Spider Man is doing. You know, it is stupid, and I'm not like (laughs) that's well. That's why they don't do it. They don't do that. Well, yeah, that's the thing. Is like you know that. There is a learning curve to these things, and tastes do change. That's yeah, something absolutely. to that's something to acknowledge. Like 
Kaylee makes a good point that modern audiences would probably not tolerate and this I shit. I 100% agree. Like, most people would not, like, these days would not probably want to slog through that. Either they want to read a novel or they want to read a comic. Right. And it's hard for people, even, even uh, well, when we were talking about Sandman, how hard it is sometimes to hand people even a book from, like, 25 years ago or something mm-hmm. and have them be like, oh, my God, there's so much text. Right. and. You know, it's absolutely. I, I feel like part of this is that there is this struggle that kind of goes on with the medium. I think where it wants to be like, like you said, it wants to come across as this like illustrative visual novel. Yeah, yeah. but it also kind of it, it's hard then to treat it with comic gloves. Or, you know, to sit there and be like, well, this is what we expect of comics. Mm. And this over here is what we expect of, like, a storybook for children. And I think that sometimes there's there's a struggle that if you are going to be creating an illustrated version of a novel, maybe you should stop and think that six issues doesn't cut it to impart well, sure. your information mm-hmm. well in this new medium. And I think that you, like, Pacific Comics, who, is, who adapted this originally, like... I'm sure they would have loved for this to have been like a 36-part epic masterpiece of a story. But again, this is the beginning of miniseries comics. This is one of six, right? Yeah. That did not exist in the 80s. So it wasn't until like the mid-80s that you started to have miniseries that were successful. And the reason for that is um, there were no comic book stores. You could not walk into a comic book store in 1975 and go buy a comic book that was new. You couldn't do it. All you were buying was back issues. Mm -hmm. That existed all the way up until the direct market, pretty much. Like, Mm -hmm. the way you got new comics was you would walk to a newsstand or you'd go to a grocery store and you'd buy whatever they had on the newsstand. And like magazines, once they basically expired, they threw them out or sent them back or strip covered them. And that's why a lot of old comics are worth money is because... They were all destroyed. They yeah. didn't get Superman, saved. Action Comics, what, number one, had like a million copies printed. Like four exist now because of a lot of those practices where they would... I think it's like 13. And, yeah, but it's like but four yeah. in good condition. Yeah, but like, yeah, most you know, of them are just trash. Yeah, because they'd rip the covers off and whatever, and then you hand them to kids and they read them. And so when, news, when uh, newsstands and grocery stores and stuff would order comics, they would never order a number one. Like, why would you? You don't know if you're going to sell any, right? So you want Flash 242. Like, mm-hmm. that's what you want. This is comic business. It's been around for a long time. It's a sure bet. I'm going to buy it. This is why they didn't renumber comics ever. Renumbering comics is a modern invention. Because now, a number one sells a book. Back in the day, a number one was such a fucking gamble. Risk, yeah. And so they never made miniseries. This is the birth of miniseries comics. Yeah, this I- was like, they took a massive chance on this. They talk about it in the back matter of Crisis on Infinite Earth, which is a 12 issue miniseries written by the best selling writer in, in the world uh, in, of comics, mm-hmm. especially at DC, and the best selling illustrator at DC. And they still were like, I don't know if this is going to work. We don't know if this is going to sell because a miniseries was such a fucking gamble. I also will point to Crisis on Infinite Earth as if you want to read fucking dialogue that makes you want to gouge your goddamn eyes out <laughs> and caption boxes that go on for days, look four years later than this book at Crisis on Infinite Earths and realize that it is, while I love it, it is written in the style that all comic books were written in the 80s. You look at stuff like Hellblazer and Sandman and they pointed that and Swamp Thing, Saga of the Swamp Thing, and people were like, oh my God, comics are art. And you realize it's because they were reading stuff like this all the time Mm -hmm. that that felt like such a breath of fresh air. Now, we've had so many people emulate the way that that is... That, done that yeah, i feel like this is this is a relic of an older era of comics and i said on the last episode when i pitched this is like people don't draw comics like this anymore they would not even dream to draw comics like this anymore because it wouldn't it doesn't work in the same way yeah well, and i think that even when p craig russell who would adapt novels later such as uh it's star What's the Neil Gaiman one that Stardust. I always... Stardust. Stardust. I always yeah. say the name, wrong name of... Where Vested did good job. Um, he, and he did it... Charles Vest. Charles Vest and P. Craig Russell worked on that together. And I think P. Craig Russell did the layouts in this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think and he had a similar job. Did he just do the layouts? He did layouts and colors. Okay, because yeah. I was going to say, it, like, 
it said p craig wrestle on it and it looks nothing like anything else i've seen him it's, do yeah he did colors with somebody else yeah. too. okay who i can't remember the yeah. other person but did you can see his layouts yeah you can mm-hmm. see like like uh this we'll see, kind of like, stuff like where it's like a big circle panel in the middle of pages yeah. like that's his layout style you or have the, the, the tall borders. panels with the rounded corners on top mm-hmm. like that's all his okay style. Yeah. And there's yeah. a layouts. lot of really cool things that were done in the panels like mm-hmm. i think it's the first page of the first episode there when um uh, the the evil cousin of Your elric kind of- um when he is talking to elric their panel is long and fairly tall but is divided by the steroid by the stairway oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, and them. it makes this really cool dynamic panel so mm-hmm. there's a lot of really cool things that go in in this comic so oh, i yeah. can appreciate it for what it did especially considering the time however it's not my cup of tea yeah no i mean and this is I, literally the same argument i would use to crucify a game like ocarina of time to people is like it is of its thing, and, like, I get that everybody loves it because it is, like, a thing that you had in the past, but, like, it does not hold up in any way to anything that came after This, it. And this I, is why I always, always, always use this argument when people, when people are using first as the mm-hmm. reason why something is good. Right. I taste vomit in the back of my mouth. It yeah. pisses me off. Mm-hmm. Because just because something is first does not mean it's the best. Right. The whole point of looking at something like this is... Um, especially in comparison, like you said, to Swamp Thing or Sandman mm-hmm. or something later, is when you look at something that is a first and then you look at what came after it, you have to think about like picking and kind of going, what did they see in this that made this book over here successful in right. ways that this original or this first title was not? And what did they take and, from this that they thought was successful about this exactly, to like implement exactly. their own work? I, mm-hmm. yeah. I like to call that the prototype effect. Mm-hmm. And my go-to example is always Tolkien. Mm-hmm. reading the lord of the rings i'm sorry to any lord of the rings fans it is borderline interminable like, it's awful it's just I'm it's so sorry. hard to read those books because yeah. they're so long yep and like they're not even they're like all put together they're the length of like one modern fantasy book but there's yeah. so much like just walking and, and nothing describing happening, of every and the, blade of gla- grass and, like and all those opening doors they're, yeah. they're so hard to read but he created fantasy yeah like, when we think of modern mm. fantasy, we think of Tolkien. Mm-mm. Yes, that's not 100% true. Yeah, um, if by Tolkien you mean the Kalevala, then yes. So, you know, it's that that's my thing looking at this Elric one, too, is when we talk about firsts and protos and stuff, being like, this is the first ever thing, fantasy story mm. like this. And I'm like, or it could be the direct rip of a Finnish mythological story too that's I mean, cool too the bible well, first was like isn't, the first fantasy story remember? yeah oh, where it's like first sh- first doesn't <laughs> you know first is not winner this is right. this no, is guess. not kindergarten where we go like i was first you yeah, know yeah. so it's many people best is the have, real question have come along since tolkien mm-hmm. and done fantasy better yeah well they proved upon the ideas that he kicked off they mm-hmm. it's it's all about like well i call a lot of modern writing remix fiction but a lot yeah. of it are remix you know well, I mean, um, media. I, I, I think ultimately everything is yeah. a remix. Yeah, and I think that to be a good uh, or a uh, interesting or someone who gathers a lot of attention um, in in the world of like modern writing or media, like you have to be an expert at remix of remixing genres or remixing, like taking the elements that Tolkien did and adding your own elements or someone else's elements to make. To make the fantasy work in a way that you you want it to work, you know, and so it it comes down to what did the th- what are the things that Tolkien did well? Like what did he establish that I loved, and then taking that and adding it to other things that you also love, and then mix mashing that together. Yeah, absolutely. And I just I feel like this is uh, of its era. I discovered this. Um, I mean, because the the first trade of this that I have, the one that I've since sold Joe, which I talked about in the last issue, uh, was printed as a trade paperback in 1986, which is super rare. Um, and it was $15 in 1986, which in 1986 money is more than $15 is oh, yeah. now. Um, um, back then a video game cost 20 bucks. Yeah. So it was expensive for a comic book that was like a dollar 25 per issue or what I didn't even know oh, how much that, these were. Back in the these early are 80s. 50. 
Yeah, and that's like really like expensive. Premium comics at a yeah. buck fifty. Yeah. Like a few years earlier, these would have been like lead stories in heavy metal. Yeah, absolutely. Like a anthology magazine that yeah. prints comics and fiction and like just artwork. Yeah. They wouldn't have been their own thing. And I so I discovered this while I was working at Olympic Cards and Comics. It was just sitting there on the shelf because for some reason no one had bought it and it was just I mean, it's so good. Why wouldn't you buy none? <laughs> um, it was sitting there on the shelf, and I, I like, I had it in my hand. It was bigger than all the other trades, and it just felt like uncovering, like the Ark of the Covenant or something. It was just like this distant moment in comics time that somehow jumped out at me, and I was holding it in my hands. And I love the original printing of it. It's a little bit glossier paper, but not like full gloss and. Uh, it was like bigger than a normal comic. Like it was a larger size trade and it was just so cool. And something I wanted to talk about is the reason I pitched this is they're being reprinted now through Titan comics. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, I had digital copies of this, so I gave them to everybody else to read digitally. But I also went and picked up to look at the physical copy now. And unfortunately, like the hardcover is beautiful, but the interior is like really not well reproduced. Like That's everything is like fuzzy and blurry and like the paper is so like low quality or it's rough. I don't know if it's low quality, but it's like very rough paper and it just makes all the ink that is already been transferred kind of loosely, like look even looser on the page. And so everything feels like kind of blurry and I was really disappointed in the new printing of this. So that kind of made me sad because something I like about reading this digitally is although the colors aren't what we would call modern colors or maybe not something that someone would totally love. I feel like they pop a lot better than the new they definitely printing. popped digitally. Yeah. Um, I haven't looked at the new printing. It's not, is it like the newspaper type? It's like it's paper thicker or? than that, but it's like just as rough. Oh, like I the wonder texture if they're trying to emulate that older comic. Thing. Yeah, but it's, just I feel like these were printed on glossier paper though. I mean, like they look like it in the transfers and, yeah. and, I just, I don't know. And it makes me want to go dig up old issues. I have no idea how much this would cost in issues. But there are some panels in this book that just like, you know, there's just caption boxes happening. I'm holding up, it's page uh, 13 of issue one. It's just caption boxes happening where it's like setting the stage of what what Mel Damone is, like what the background, yeah, is. But it's like a cool tiny panel across the top. There's all the silhouetted city of Mel Damone. And then there's just like, this is like, three wise men wizard type guys with like one guy's got fire coming out of his head and the other guy's got a halo and <laughs> another guy's got like a sun coming out of his hand. I don't even know what's going on, but it was so like, it just made me feel like I was there and that I didn't understand anything that was happening. And I was totally okay with it. Cause I was like, this shit is like magic well above me. And the whole meeting of the elemental, the Lord, uh, the, the merman, um, Shasha. Sha, sha, uh, he's got like two A's sure, in the middle sort of his name. Sure, it's some sort of onomatopoeic way of communicating the sound of ocean waves. So we'll just go shh. <laughs> he's got two A's in the middle of his name. So yeah. it's hard to <laughs> uh, for me to pronounce. Um, but yeah, he meets like this elemental lord at mm -hmm. the bottom of the ocean. And he's got like seaweed and clams and stuff running off him. And I was like, ah, this is so yeah. cool. This like... And then the fly, and then he transforms into this there like were a beautiful lot of angel really fiery great guy. Great concepts in it, that yeah. I definitely really appreciated. Um, like the magic of this world is enthralling yeah. to I me. Would and definitely I definitely love to see like a Game of Thrones TV show level production of Elric. I would, dude. Too, I think for a, a modern I think audience. a lot of people would. Yeah. Um, for a lot of reasons, but I, Kaylee, I was seeing you make some mouth words and I wanted to hear what they were. Oh, <laughs> um, so I am, I'm curious cause I wasn't able to do as much research as I wanted. Uh, this, so this came out in 82, right? Yeah. The singles came out 81, 82. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, I was not alive. Mm -hmm. Um, neither was I. Same. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> Surprise. I was. Um, but if. My my history knowledge is on par, I guess. That was a weird way to phrase that. Whatever. Um, this would have been one of the first comics to have this level of high fantasy. 
Well, right? Or did no. was Conan coming? Conan out before? was well before this. Okay, you had Conan the Barbarian and Conan of uh, Cameria were both being published at Marvel Comics in the seventies. Yeah, but they're not high fantasy. No, they're, uh, they're sword, sword and sorcery, sorcery in the same level that you would call this sword and sorcery. Well, I too. I want to kind of I want to kind of talk about, about that genres. actually. Um, talk about it a little bit. I'd Do really it. like to talk about Go that. Go for it. Um, so. I, I couldn't help but find it vaguely hilarious that uh, Tolkien keeps coming up in this because of this like legendary distaste that Moorcock had for oh. everything he stood for. Yeah, um, and the- how still he's being compared to this guy, and it always makes me laugh. Yeah, Moorcock okay. was very like anti-Tolkien. Yeah, and, and actually, um, one of his earlier jobs was i think uh editing a you know science fiction fantasy magazines and he was quite vocal about his distaste for this muscle-bound power you know power king mick awesome mm-hmm. like again like edgar rice burroughs's work like these you know powerful muscular yeah. grunt grunt kind of fantasy they men. just don't die and that's their best quality <laughs> yeah and, and i wanted to come back to this whole thing about that like counterculture thing and may Mm. it or why it may be so interesting and successful in time like 1982 um especially talking about a a drug addicted hero you Mm. know kind of thing um in in the face of our our perceptions of fantasy at that point which you know tolkien kind of informed the whole elf thing as these kind of like higher sweeter you know like greater knowledge than thou Mm. soft voice flowing dress sort of things um and then you kind of have you know elric Mm. coming in and and when we were talking about art in this i kept thinking about uh comparing in my head the picture we get of like lord of the rings elves and things like that and this beautiful Mm. flowy kind of thing and uh, this kind of again more academic hero, mm-hmm. weaker, more frail, things like that, until he, of course, gets the Stormbringer and everything like that. Um, but it's and, his and knowledge how, that grants him yeah, greater but, power, right? But his, popular, from knowledge comes power. But popular culture in the late 70s and 80s, you know, in in music, mm-hmm. you know, in art and things like that, we're, we're getting this rise of this thin, waif-like, you know, what is gender kind of... Look at the crowd that are it was like yes, the same yes. year as this, right? Exactly. Was the and, and and that's what I'm thinking about about the time of publication of this comic, what was coming to be popular yeah. at the time in, in music, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you've got like Bowie. And, got and, yeah, these, androgyny and, yeah. and the cure and 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 that is one thing in one regard to reading this that I couldn't get my brain off of mm-hmm. is uh, how making this adaptation you can see it as a product at the time oh, too, stylistically. Absolutely. Um and it was also very nice for me to see some sort of fantasy story that wasn't so firmly rooted in Western medieval kind of stylistic choices Absolutely. because I'm so freaking done with that. You just, oh my God. Um, so done with that. But uh, using these styles like uh, kind of Art Nouveau for these mm-hmm. panel borders and these these sort of otherworldly things that felt like it was knitting a little bit more of the sensibilities of science fiction art into this Mm -hmm. fantasy setting. Um, So people who know me know that I'm not a fantasy person. Typically, I just, I don't like it because 90% of the time it's the same shit. It's like, hey, look at these dwarves. Oh my God, it's a dragon. Oh my God, it's a dwarf. (laughs) Oh my God. Oh my God. There's a kingdom and somebody wants it. Blah, blah, blah. Same shit. Some magic item of some kind and we have to get it or take it somewhere or destroy it or find it. One of the two. All of them. (laughs) And and the miladies and all that shit. Like, I just, I don't dig that. And so, at least for reading this book, I was able to view it more favorably by casting it in the light of the time in which it was made. Mm -hmm. And that gave me a new color, I guess, in what I was looking at rather than, oh, great, more of this fantasy shit, like, you know, like fairy elf kind of crap. And I think it's interesting, too, that Roy Thomas did that to this work, like let the time of the 80s color, because I think if I'm not wrong, and Mannix would be able to correct me, but I think... He did a lot of the adaptations of the Conan Absolutely. stuff, yeah, in the seventies. So like mm-hmm. he took that and definitely like hyped up the machismo of Conan in those comics, but yeah. was able to not do that 
in this book. And I think that that's kind of a testament to Roy Thomas, maybe if, if you don't love his writing in this book, but just like knowing what LT worked on and that he isn't like same voice plastering over all these different fantasy writers that he actually has some reverence for the work he's adapting. Well, yeah, that's, he's, that's how you do adaptation uh, properly, is that I, I can give him yeah. serious credit for that yeah. because he understood the sensibility of this character is directly created as a counterculture mm-hmm. response to Tolkien perceptions of, of you know what fantasy is well, supposed the, to the, look like. One of the big things that Tolkien does with elves in Lord of the Rings is their immortality. Yeah. It's one of the more interesting things he brings up about them is like elves don't die. They don't get diseases. They don't get sick. They, they don't die unless they go to war. So yeah. it's a big deal that the elves show up to help in the, in the fight against Sauron because like they don't have to and they won't die if they don't. They can just peace out to the Grey Isles and they'll live forever. So that was kind of like one of the things he was touching on. But one of the first things you see in this Michael Moorcock story about it's Elric is about death. about war and is, death. Yeah. You have the the mother dying in childbirth and you have a sickly weak diseased little boy yes and i think that is a direct like um it turned kind of that contradiction elf thing on the head you of know? the way tolkien saw elves yeah tolkien elves i've uh i was at that age in high school when those movies were coming out and i have very vivid memories of my various female friends and their you know hushed tones and love for these, you know, movie elves kind of things. Everybody loves Legolas. I mean, yeah, that doesn't you know, have anything to do with Legolas. Again, I remember sitting there and being Orlando like, they're Bloom. so fucking boring. Like, if I had to <laughs> pick a society to live in, it would not be that one. It would be the dwarves. As it was boring as shit, you know? And yeah. my friends were, like, all about it. And I'm like... And I started thinking about that in terms of, like, Mary Sueism and things like that. <laughs> where I'm like, well, there's nothing interesting about Tolkien's elves to me. They're just... They're just there mm. being perfect. They're marble statues. And there's a huge contrast in Moorcock's work to have immediately your hero is sick, your hero mm-hmm. is weak. They're not this untouchable sort oh, of yeah. ideal thing. Their society and in fact, is corrupt. They're morally corrupt. Yeah, yeah. They have slaves, blood sacrifice. They yeah. worship chaos gods. Like I, it was, It's all as well, a direct like opposite of the way Tolkien saw much it. More as intrigued. I was reading it, I felt like... If this was a traditional fantasy story, you would be reading this from the like the barbarians point oh, of yeah, view. Oh yeah, absolutely. As they're overthrowing this evil, corrupt mm-hmm. city totally. of yeah. you know, immortals who enslave yeah. their people and who mutilate them for their own purposes because they cut their slaves' mouths and throats in a certain way so that they can only sing one perfect oh, note. Yeah. And they (laughs) of all the things to include in an adaptation of a full length novel, like I think that tells you so much about elves. I think it was a good choice. Yeah, it's a good thing to keep. If you need to trim the fat, I feel like culture is rarely fat in my mindset. Man, and it just like it put me there, you know? Yeah. Like I I couldn't stop imagining what that society would be like. And when the barbarian king fights Elric and he says, you know, you're not men, you're not gods, but you act like them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just like, Yep. I'm there. I'm in. I'm into all of this. I don't know. This touches a lot of the right nerves for me, as far as like what I like fantasy to kind of tackle, as far as philosophy of societies, I guess. And that, it makes me want to read uh, Michael Moorcock books because I've never read any. This is my only exposure to Michael Moorcock is through this exact story, uh, which I found randomly uh, at a com- comic book store, bought, and then now Joe owns my copy. I, I was only put- aware of the influence. That was all of my knowledge of Moorcock. Was like I was only aware of his influence as a um, dissenter, I guess, oh, yeah. Yeah. in in fantasy, and that was enough to at least spark my interest at one point. Well, and then the great yeah. Neil, you know, yeah. Neil Neil Gaiman talking about having read. Um, some of these stories when he was young and yeah. inf- it being influential oh, in the I, creation I, of a dream. Oh, absolutely. That's what made me care. Yeah, I, I absolutely can oh, yeah. see the influence of this on Sandman. Yeah. Absolutely. And I guess that's why I was kind of surprised that you guys were like, man, it's boring and there's so much narration and stuff. And I was like, guys, we we read Sandman. Yeah. <laughs> like, you remember we just read, like, this is the same. Well, for me, uh, <laughs> prose wasn't as purple. I mean, yeah. again, I this is kind of more of my my jams. 
than right. Sandman just because like of the subject matter. It's not that I don't like Neil Neil Gaiman. Would you it's call it like, a sand jam? I yeah. Can, uh, this, can you please that's just not do that for me? Jam. There we are. This Thank is you. my sand, <laughs> sand <laughs> jam. Kaylee and I, I know uh, the movie, sand yeah. jam. I need to yeah. put my copy of the Chronicles of Amber into your hands. Yeah, I, I would. I would that. love to read because you explained it to me before, and I'm like, yeah, I need to read that. Okay, remind me. I'll bring it next time. After Brant describing what happens to what's his name Corum Corwin Corwin no the the guy who gets the hand and the eye oh 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 it's okay, another yeah. one of the From eternal Warcock champions yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 that guy I want to read that one too and actually yeah. I saw those on the shelf uh at the bookstore that I work at today and I was like I oh, should cool. fucking get those because they're all they've all been reprinted in yeah. like cool new paperback versions that are affordable and nice and I yeah, might pick um, them up. The, cool. the whole thing in Sandman where they go to the gallery and they mm-hmm. like touch their siblings item and that lets them speak to them and like, Oh yeah. Yeah. This visit is from... them. That is straight out of the Chronicles of Amber. Yeah. Yeah. And you described that on the uh, Sandman and yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah. So I want to, I want to pick that up too. Cause that sounds cool. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's from the same period of time, late seventies, early eighties. Yeah. I've been so spoilers. Uh, for episodes of Out of the Fridge, which have not yet debuted or even been announced. Um, but we're reading, we're doing adaptation stuff, and we realize accidentally we all picked books from the 80s to read. So I have been reading 80s comics like super <laughs> hardcore this month, and I'm so into it. I'm so into it. So this was just like scratching every itch that I had for fantasy comics from the 80s. It was, it was fun. I had a question for you guys, though, um, because... A large portion of this story is one of my least favorite tropes ever in writing, which is, I have to go get a lady. Yep. Yeah. How do you guys yep. feel about that? Oh, God. I th- you know, honestly, I think I think that's like 90% of the reason why I was screaming as yeah. I was reading this. A lot, um, of, a lot of unnecessary titties in this comic. Well, okay. No not, titties. Not even, they're always necessary. Not even that. It was just like the the pros used to describe them making love, or it was just disgusting. It was like the it was like gross, like fedora neck. You mean beard. a sweaty fourteen year old boy hiding under his blanket at his you know when his parents are asleep with a flashlight? Like, Ain't gonna get my more cock books. Yeah. You know? Oh, gross. Uh, it just Shit like on me. like reading it. I was just going like ew 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 ew. Yeah. Like, it was just gross. It was just <laughs> like never they gonna made, have they a girl. Made, Friend. Yeah. They made it's, love it's like passionately. Four, it's fiercely. Four. Fiercely. No, fiercely. No, it's, Ugh. it's Ugh. no, no, wrong, but wrong. I'll read it to you. It said, Outside oh, the day warms, the wind drops, and while within, the emperor and empress to be God. make love in a cave. tenderly, Ugh. passionately. Ugh. Even fiercely. Gross. Really? Why is yeah. it? Why is it that we're so you? fond no. of making fun of like romance books written for women when the ones that are written for men are just as fucking pathetic? They're okay, ridiculous. Yeah, I totally agree with why that sentiment that because like this is in no way as offensive to I think anyone as anything described in Fifty Shades of Grey. I'm not comparing the two because no. Fifty Shades of Grey isn't a romance novel. But yeah, absolutely. No. To, no, to, to the people who it's purchase it. It's a rape it, fantasy. I agree yeah, with you difference. that it is a rape fantasy, and <laughs> um, I think it's a horrible pile of garbage. But the women who buy it as a romance novel see it as as a romance hey, fantasy. Okay, no, are the guys no, are the guys buying this for just the romance aspect or are they buying it for a vague sense of power and fantasy that they themselves don't experience? I don't I think, think anyone it bought little... it for these four panels. No, well, that's what anyway, I'm saying. It's okay. like this, these four a... panels have to be indicative the writing of them is indicative of the general mood of, you know, this story of this like not so strong, not so, you know, beefy kind of guy mm-hmm. that these panels just kind of flow with the rest of this kind of male fantasy thing that's already going about. You're not as strong How is as this everyone a male else. Fantasy? Because yeah. it's just it's just the way that it's written. It's the way that the panels are drawn. It's just because like, it's got it's, a man's butt for no, full no, front and center. On, I mean, like on. that may be some let of me, our fantasy. Let me talk. Okay, yeah. so 
this, if it was just these four panels on its own, it really would not be a big deal. It would be an eye roll and a groan. Sure. And that would be it. Context. Yeah. The rest of the book, when uh, fucking, I'm just going to call him Jester Guy because I hate him. Yarkoon. So, I don't care. <laughs> I hate his face. Ugly McShitlord. Yeah. yeah. Well. Ugly McShitlord. Yeah. When yeah. he is walking into the city after ha- like having a pushed Elric yeah. uh, like, off the boat and stuff. Yeah. We're going to go rape in the streets. Yeah. First, yeah. Not first off, there's that. But walks into the city like a woman he will soon possess. It's like, for fuck's sake. Like, oh, yeah. come the, on. Yeah, again, though. First off, sex doesn't work like that. Like, the, none of that shit works like that. Also, is it necessary? I not think really. you missed is the it... point on that, though. No. I didn't. She gets I, that I he's get it. evil. She gets I get that he's that bad, he's but it's still like, no. I get that indulgent. he is super indulgent. I get that he is hedonistic. I like. I get why they might use that imagery and why you might, why it might be justified. However, when it's repeatedly used, it's just it's annoying. It's, it's a means frustrating. To it's a, in it yeah, and it's a part of a, a culture in comics that at the time was very exclusionary. Probably on accident in wow. this case. Like, I'm sure, uh, you know, they weren't writing and drawing and, you know, laying out panels and stuff in the shape of the doors going, hmm, this looks like a vulva and that'll keep the women's away. Yeah, they you got know? their yeah. own vulva. They don't need ours. Don't need ours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it's just when it's when it's constant and when it's repetitive, it's just really frustrating to read because, you know, like. Now being a part of the modern comics movement, what what attitudes like that did to women at that time, where it was very much so like, oh, you know, milady, and they are good for nothing. Like the uh, how do you pronounce her name? Syndrome. Syndrome. Uh, you mean faints in five seconds? Yeah, faints in five <laughs> it's, seconds. It's because Simmeral. Simmeral. Um, she does nothing. She well, does... she orders the people of the kingdom to slay her brother. Okay. And then she they faints. Don't... Yeah, well, and after... they don't listen. Okay. And they well, don't listen. Why listen. They do li- Her The captain of her guards does listen and goes to attack the prince and then gets killed. And then he's like, nope, you're mine. I've got you. Look it around you. Your people don't love you. They love me. And then he gropes her and she faints. It's like, I'm not justifying yeah. the fact that she's not a great character. She isn't a great character. But to say that she does nothing, I think, writes off the fact that she is at least a character. In okay, yeah, she's a character, and maybe she attempts to do something, but she spends, because of the nature of how the story is written, she spends most of it chained up oh, Elric, in a dungeon, are you? Boo-hoo. asleep, yeah. or fainting. Yeah, that's basically what she does. She, mm-hmm. A few moments of dialogue wherein she tries to enact action isn't enough to justify, hey, why did you write this character in a way where she is a prop and a price to be won? Because it was the nineteen late 1960s, early 70s. Well, like, yeah, I mean, and I mean, yes, and that is true. It's still shitty. It's true, I mean, but that's I, what I'm saying about parts of why this book was frustrating for me to read was that yes it's a it's a product of its time however that does not mean i have to enjoy it or forgive it it's an excuse but it's not a justification exactly no but again it's like okay i use this argument a lot when i talk about old video games because they have fucking problems and most of them are shitty uh but you can either choose to be like i'm never gonna play a game from pre this era and just go about your life as a modern reader, enjoying the modern liberation that we have or the modern technology that we have. Or you can try to find the gems that exist in something from before our era, yeah. knowing that you'll still have to dig through a lot of shit to get there first. No, She's absolutely. just pointing out the and shit I'm, that you and found. I, yeah. and, and I that's think that basically that's, it. Like, I think it's in there, but I don't think it's even close to as bad as you want to make out the the romance or the like i, I just i feel like you're wrong i'm i'm, I'm not more saying like you're wrong man. i'm just saying that like <laughs> is it as bad or did it upset you that like it's probably it's, a little more upsetting if it's something that you encounter on a regular basis. Right. Absolutely. It's and probably that's, a little so more upsetting if, if, if it's something was, you see all the goddamn time. Yeah. yeah. And it's if why this I was on it's still a own. classic, whether or not it's written well. Yeah. You know. So if this was on its own 
and it did it, it'd been like, well, that's annoying. That's, yeah. That's some shit that's, you know, in this book. Right. However, because it is a constantly repeated theme, it doesn't really matter if she has a few moments of action because she is a trope of a character that exists. No, and I understand how tropes As, work. Like, yeah. that's but the so what, reason but I what ask. I'm, but, but that's basically what I'm saying is that I don't, I wouldn't recommend this book to people except for for the history aspect right like, as i was mm-hmm. saying earlier and a part of that is because of its treatment of its female characters you have one female character and through 90 percent of the book she's treated like a prize to be one yeah like literally one female like not w-o-n but like o-n-e yeah one, one. <laughs> yeah, yeah one and, and she know. sucks <laughs> and so if so. it was this character is problematic but you also have you know maybe e- even keeping with standard you know tropes of this area era her handmaiden who tries to help her bikini warrior queen yeah or bikini (laughs) warrior queen or you know any any other character any other female character any other like non-binary character anything in that where you were like oh hey they did some interesting stuff it would help alleviate that but because there is none of that and because this is such a product of its time yeah it's incredibly frustrating to read and so maybe it's like Maybe the things that it does aren't so like terrible that it cannot be forgiven, but because it is a product of its time and because it is part of an onslaught of comics and media that did the same shit mm-hmm. over and over and over again, I don't. When a fucking don't sword don't has more personality it. than a human being, I do kind of have to wonder yeah. a little bit. Well, I mean, like, honestly. she feels like an afterthought because she's not really a character in this book, and it's fucking unfortunate that michael moorcock didn't go i should write a book with women in it and he didn't and that sucks and he is amongst hundreds if not thousands of other male writers who did the exact same well like and i get that and i get the trope of that but something that i think i guess i'm asking is like do you buy does that affect the way you feel about elric as a character that his only motivation is for her. Because- in in a lot of ways, yes, because I feel like it there there are hints of a deep and great relationship between mm-hmm. them, but you never see them because you never get to see her. You be see four anything. pages of it, and you guys yucked it the whole time. Oh well, relationship does not mean having sex with somebody in a cave. No. Hey, hey, hey! They, they, they had a pony ride. Other than they did have a pony ride, ride. <laughs> and it meant cried. a whole lot to him. And it got interrupted, and it was inconvenient for him because he, he cried. He was trying to have his fucking pony ride, and yeah, these I, assholes showed up and messed up his day. I, you know? I don't think that the point here is digging on his girl. Michael Moorcock wrote a shitty female character on purpose. No, because fuck women, not. and we hate him because of that. Like that's no. not what we're saying here. We're saying that this story was written in the middle you of the time in which there was a pervasive culture of sexism yeah and that is an unfortunate detraction from the enjoyment of the story as a modern reader absolutely yeah so yeah. how so what kaylee is essentially saying by that is with that in mind it would not be the easiest thing to recommend to a modern reader with modern sensibilities no, I, yeah i get you know that. it and that's that's I think more of the thing is that there are some things you read because they're quote important yeah. for you to read, you know, because some again cobble of like boring old white men decided this is what's interesting Absolutely. and that this is what's foundational and important because that's what survived history. Right. Because, you know, that's what again the people with the power have decided is important. Mm-hmm. If that's the reason You know, the reason is, like, you need to understand this is important because these people said it was important. And then later maybe it led to something more interesting or better Mm. or more diverse or whatever. Um, There's homework reading and there's pleasure reading. Mm -hmm. So if you're – if someone came up and asked me, you know, hey, kid, this is this book. Um, I hear it's important. Will I enjoy the book? Mm Mm-hmm. And I know that person and I know them well. I'm typically going to be like, no, you're not going to fucking enjoy it. But I'd be like, you know, but you would learn something. Yeah, well, You'd learn something about, you know, what, what we were writing about, when and why. Um, there and, is, oh, I'm yeah. sorry, I don't, I don't want to interrupt you. There, there is one thing that I wanted to point out while we were on the, the subject 
just that caught my eye looking at it on the imaginary rape orgy page. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, in one corner, there's this fat bald dude who's just rocking out with his cock out and chomping on a foot. <laughs> and for some reason, that really amused me. Yeah. Because, I mean, like, so rarely do you just get, like, a floppy dick. Mm-hmm. Well, and it always amuses me when you see that. Especially rarely. when it's juxtaposed with something that is ridiculous, like a dude eating a foot. Yeah. Rarely, I would say now, do you ever see, like, mandongs in comic books by the blue dong of dr well, manhattan but i yeah, feel like you like used to fucking see them the all the time like every 70s and 80s fantasy book i pick up there's at least one dong if not many yeah. which well, i'm like where did where did they all go yeah in underneath various loincloths and yeah. bits of like, like elven just chain mail gives, i don't know yeah everybody gives game of thrones and i keep bringing it up for whatever reason uh they keep giving that show shit because there's flaccid penises on screen and like i don't see why that's a bad thing I like the the Kevin Bacon quote about male nudity in movies. What's that? Where he was just like, "You see boobs in movies all the time. Why not? Why not penises? All the, why not more penises?" Yeah, I was literally about like, to say that. And he's like, "He's like Marvel. I have a new idea for a superhero for you. I've got an infinity gem, and it's at the end of my cock." <laughs> <laughs> that would be beautiful. And uh, yeah, no, it's I. I think that it is interesting. I mean, and it's probably not interesting. It's just weird that we see yeah. uh, so many more. Uh, boobs in movies than we do. Well, you'll, like you'll see tons of man ass. Yeah, like sure. equal proportion. I think you see in, man, like, man butt and woman butt in like PG rated movies too. Like yeah. in movies where it's like what there doesn't need to really be a man butt in this movie, but here we go. But like or you just never a butt, see as dicks it's really anymore. called. Yeah, you don't see dicks very often. Um, <laughs> no, yeah. Mm. Um, I uh, I did want to, I guess. Part of the point I was driving at is something that I've always had a problem with in in books where tropes like the damsel character are employed. Like, she is a character because they needed somebody to be damseled. Um, I guess I it disappoints me and kind of frustrates me. And I just lose faith in a hero, in a protagonist male or female when their only objective is like to get another person. And I guess that shows a lot about the cynical nature I have about love and relationships because like if your wife was captured by a, your evil cousin, you would go get her back. Right. Yeah. I mean, like I think, I think you would, I've never had a wife, so I don't know. But I'm assuming people who are married or, like, about to be married. Like, it's, I mean, it's a big deal. So, I guess I'm always disappointed when that happens in a book, when it's like, oh, somebody got damseled, and now they're going to go rescue her. But, like, it exists because it was, at one point, a good way to show you how real their love was. And I wonder if there are not better ways to show how real their love is and still give a protagonist motivation to do a thing that doesn't have to be about prize winning. I think this comes directly from the really strong influence of medieval ideals and medieval styles on fantasy is because this whole like chivalry thing comes Mm -hmm. to be such a strong current a strong undercurrent in most of these fantasy stories because i think we define fantasy so much by these western ideals of chivalry and and our image i guess of of what court life is and, and what a kingdom looks like and what opulence looks like it when when we're talking about fantasy and wealth and power it's always through this western lens of like medieval history like it's very rare that i ever see or experience any fantasy book that ever tries to bring its ass away from fucking like medieval shit it's rare and you know and i think i think it's because of code of chivalry i think chivalry Mm -hmm. and i think it's our our perception of what fantasy looks like that we keep running into these same sort of things in story um to go back further from that we um well i was reading and we know, at least like with some of Moorcock's other work, that he was, as I mentioned before, vastly 
influenced by the Kalevala mm -hmm. in making this and and you know several chapters in there um, specifically about uh, Kuleva who did this whole Stormbringer is literally taken from this story of mm -hmm. this uh, depressed misbegotten doomed woed man who doesn't really have anything interesting going on in his life except for this love. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's the same case with Elric, is that if they establish from the beginning that his life is essentially sitting on this throne, nothing really happens, nothing is really meaningful, <laughs> I guess, uh, in his kingdom either, except for this interaction with, you know, Tropy Sue, um, mm -hmm. then I guess it makes some degree of sense that one of the only sorts of active story that he might get or have is just based around somebody took this one thing that was interesting better go get it back you mm -hmm. know i i don't know i i think a lot of this is fueled from way 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 older concepts and that again this enshrining of this is classic this is valuable this is good this is canon is what makes this story exist anyway i i think that you know you really hit it on the head there um, in terms of the Middle Ages and specifically the evolution of the concept of courtly love as separate from marriage as a property contract or a political alliance, which it so frequently was that there was this evolution of this idea of romance and courting someone and courtly love that didn't – it kind of exist in – the West before that for a long time. Um, and I think a lot of the evolution of literature and this idea of the damsel comes out of the poetry of the era where you had, you know, the chivalrous knight who was going to rescue the maiden from whatever. And novels, I think, arise out of that tradition. And, you know, so the, the, this is something that is being received from several hundred years back and has been kind of ongoing for a long time. And that's one of the reasons why it's so prolific and why it's so hard to kind of get rid of this concept. But what's sad about that, I think about the chivalry thing is that fantasy so frequently cherry picks the concepts of chivalry that it wants to put in for the story to be interesting for certain audiences. If it were to actually follow things like code of chivalry, um, one of the things a lot of people don't think about in that is like the vast importance of consent. Um, you know, they talk about, you know, knights receiving favors and things like that. And this idea of dedicating yourself to a lady or to a person, she was under no onus whatsoever to you sexually, uh, emotionally or otherwise that this chivalry concept was pledging your affection or your love for this person, but not implying ownership. And so I am really interested, I guess, in this whole thing of, you know, this, this brother going after his sister as more of a kind of weird attainment thing, uh, at least just in light of what we actually know about chivalry versus what fantasy tells us about chivalry, too, where, you know, the great knight is great because she chooses to love him back, even though that's never really part of the yeah. equation. I will, I one minor niggling correction in there is that the Oops. idea of courtly love and the idea of chivalry are different and that the code of chivalry the ten commandments of chivalry include nothing about women yeah. they're all about like love the church defend the church defend the country you come from uh protect the weak and helpless like and the reason for that is because those were written the that ancient code of chivalry was written in like the 11th and 12th century and that's Crusades era. Yeah. No, so they're, they're they, definitely, they're separate but connected concepts yeah. that especially yeah. like grew closer together over time. Right. In yeah. the 1400s is when the like courtly love ideas like really glommed onto chivalry and became part of the Arthur mythos. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think, and I may be wrong, it's been a long time since I read this, I think those were written by a woman. Well, the the Arthur myths. Well, the sh the French Arthur myths that were okay. written in the 1400s. Now, someone can correct well, me. I'm not the not the T uh, T H White. No, it's T S White. No, T S White. 
thinking of Thomas Mallory, Le Mort de Arthur. No, before that. Well, I, I was going to say I don't. I don't know who wrote them before that or if they were even written down because I know those... he was compiling a, an older oral tradition. Right. Because those those stories um, – Because that's like 1600s, right? Oh, I want to say it's 1500s. My mother would know exactly okay. what my it is. Arthur... I'm sure she'll correct us. Um, no, but my impression is, is that those Arthur stories actually go back hundreds and hundreds of years mm-hmm. and were one of those things that were constantly updated for the modern day. Right. Over and over and over again, over several hundred years, um, which is until like people, they were eventually written down yeah, by Mallory. Think Arthur probably lived in closer to like the eight hundreds or. Oh, I thought it was even earlier than that. I thought yeah, it was, it was an like, Iron Age. I thought it would have been an Iron early Age king. post-Roman occupation. I think some, like fourth or eighth century or something like that. Well, again. We we on the show know nothing. Roman occupation. We're wrong about most things. In the Western Roman Empire would have ended in like three seventy whatever when Rome fell, and then the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, went on until like the fifteenth or sixteenth longer century, than that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I feel like we're getting pretty far afoot. So, um, I guess Elric. the but the reason I brought that up was I guess tropes were created. Because they were effective at doing a thing, showing the love between a husband and his wife, showing motivation for stuff. But just, there's got to be a better way to show those things. Yeah, well, and I think think those are the kind of things that like that take time, though. Yeah, well, I mean, there are lots of tropes. Yeah, there's nothing inherently wrong with a trope in the abstract. The problem with those tropes specifically Mm -hmm. of the damsel is that it is specifically appealing to one gender. Yeah, sure. When you, I guess, I guess the bigger thing is when you enshrine certain tropes as valuable and and classic and classic because they're valuable and valuable because they're classic. Right. I guess that's, that's just what ends up happening is somebody goes, well, this is the, this is the right way to communicate this, or this is the you know, legendary epic way to communicate mm. this thing for a legendary epic story. It's also the easy way. Exactly. Yeah. That's what happens is that it becomes shorthand for mm-hmm. better writing. Yeah. And people so, assume because it's that relatable. that yeah. is the way that people should interact with one another. Right. Yeah. They go, oh, well, I know this, so I understand it. You know, so. Sure. Yeah. No, absolutely. Rather than writing a more compelling reason for him to do things or making him a more nuanced and interesting character. It's always why I fight for stories. It's shorthand. Yeah, it's shorthand. It's always why I fight for stories with complicated relationships mm-hmm. where things aren't the picture perfect, idyllic, where things are strange, where people stray outside of, you know, easy monogamy or easy, like, oh, we, we set this setting here. We did put these characters here. They're married. Done. End of story. Like, Throwing some kind of complication and lay and uh, conflict creates layers and depth, mm-hmm. and, I, and it's why I always fight for stuff like that. And it is probably my major complaint with this story is like I kind of want Elric to do stuff because he wants to do it, and not because and, it's like yeah. And I haven't read any of the books, but that's right. kind of where we leave him at the end of the story. Is he's saying like, "Hey, I I rescued this girl, mm-hmm. and I love her, but I'm." gonna put her aside for a little while because i kind of feel like i have to go and do this thing yeah. for the good of not just myself but my people yeah so so i don't know some character growth it has least. it has issues and i still like i totally understand where where kaylee's coming from on the art although i will boo and poo poo you because i love the art it's not perfect but it's fun i really love the colors i love the colors too I just I like how long all the panels are and like the, how tall. And... I like the I I actually I agree with on the panel or the panels and the panel borders. That's yeah. uh, if I yeah. were to yeah. say like something positive about the art for this, it would definitely be about how innovative and interesting the panel just, layouts are. It put me there, like having the court interrogator, bad. like covered in blood and like bowing and smiling and being like, "We figured it out." And then I was just like, "Ah!" Oh, like I feel it made me feel stuff. And it's not a thing that all. It made me feel the feelings that are inside me. It's not <laughs> it a thing that all the hard stuff, stuff about things. Yeah, it's yeah. not <laughs> something that all modern comics can do. Mm-hmm. One of these days, I'm going to get y'all to read Ring of the Nibelung, which I, is also drawn by I Craig Russell. Started and is reading it. 
I started reading it. It's there's a big new collection of it, and it was at Olympic Cards and Comics the other day while I was there, and I started flipping through it. Is that that's one of those beautiful? boy do I like the story, but please like get his art away from my eyes yeah. situations. It's too sharp. It's gonna poke something. I could wait a year before we read that. <laughs> I could totally wait a year before we read enough. another Pete Greg Russell thing. <laughs> well, hey, I, you, I have to have explain. I think I'm Pete over Greg Russell thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, quite so. a few. In fact, last we we were recording for the hate. horror podcast, and I just had to slog Hater's through his hate. sinful adaptation of Coraline. Yeah, which had no personality whatsoever. So ever. boring. So I was like, so I think that's why I'm. I've had it like up to here with him right now it's like i i think i would be more charitable if i didn't just read an utter failure of an adaptation from him less than a week ago mm -hmm. so it's like i oh. i don't know i understand why he's important um and he's important comic to art and everything like else. him yeah you I know because they've decided he's important. you know important um and it's well, well, i mean i i have yeah. only read a very few things by him but i wouldn't typically describe his art as sharp but Maybe I've been reading the wrong mm. things. I mean, it's long and it's angular and... I can see for this it was significantly more fun to look at than the, what well, I was looking at in Well, he the layouts in yeah, this too. So well, I, did, I, well I, the layouts in Coraline were great too. I there think that really he did the layouts work. and the other guy did the pencils and then Russell did the inks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's and what it colors. was. Well, I don't or something. I was looking at it. They split it all up. But it's Gibson, right? Who does, yeah. Who does the mm -hmm. actual like pencil work. I don't, which yeah. I think is all really strong. Like, I don't know. I guess it's it's up to... Obviously, it's up to... Read it for yourself. Yeah. You know? And tell me how you feel. But I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of stuff like this, um, despite its problems. Totes. I've totally got my things like that. Lord knows. <laughs> I had a fun time. So yeah. do we want to move on to recommendations? Yeah, let's. All right. Do uh, we have a... We do not have a fan okay. pitch this week. So it is just the four pitches. Um, uh, and I can start if you sure. want. Uh, so I am bringing back a relatively recent pitch. Uh, I am pitching Friends with Boys by Faith Aaron Hicks, who is, I believe, going to be at Emerald City Comic Con next year, which I'm excited about. Yeah. Uh, I think I read that. And if you miss, missed Kaylee's recent pitch on this from a few weeks ago, this is a one-and-done graphic novel. It was originally released as a webcomic. Um, and it is about a girl who has been homeschooled. She has four older brothers. Mm -hmm. uh, and each of the kids in her family, when they hit high school, they stopped being homeschooled and they went to public school for high school. And she's the youngest one, and it's kind of her turn. Uh, and so she is just starting out her freshman year of high school. She's never been to school before. Um, and it's kind of about her and the friends that she makes and her relationship with her brothers and her father and her, like her mom has died. Uh, and also there's a ghost that is haunting her. Uh, and it's touching and sweet and a lot of fun. And I really dig the art and it's a super good book and I would totally love to read it. And it's black and white. And it is mm -hmm. black and white. And yeah, 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 yeah. It's a it's a good book. Um, Kaylee, I what would you like to bring? This bringing week? the first omnibus volume, I guess, of yeah. Hackslash, um, which I have not read all of it yet. Mm -hmm. um, I've read a few issues here and there, and I've been meaning to read it. But it follows Cassie Hack, who survives a an attack by a serial killer. And who goes on to kill other serial killers. Slashers. Slashers, specifically. They're, they're different than serial killers. Okay. It's, I mean, it's like I the, haven't read it yet, okay. so that's been my pitch to it. Um, so slash, slashers are like 80s style slashers, like 80 movie, 80s movies slashers, like Michael Myers and Jason of Friday the 13th, and in that they are not just killers, but there is a supernatural element too, and that's why they're tough to kill. But she is expert at killing them because she has firsthand knowledge, having lived through a slasher attack. So she is like the antithesis of all of the 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 ladies in '80s slasher movies, which run and escape only through luck or circumstance. And mm -hmm. she throws herself into the heart of battling these uh, monsters. So is it kind of like if Nev Campbell from Scream like went on to? like hunt 
Except that in Scream, that it's not supernatural. No, it's not. That's right. True. Yeah, but yeah, kind but of. Yeah. yeah. Like after after winning, after it's like uh, what's her name from uh, Halloween? I don't remember the character's name, but uh, Jamie Lee Curtis in yeah. Halloween. Like after surviving an attack of a family member, of Michael Myers, going on to then go find Jason and Freddy Krueger and all these other ones and fight them, and she crosses over with actual movie ones like Chucky and uh, Evil Ernie, who's a comic one, and uh, the Reanimator and a bunch of cool ones. And it's great. And she has a uh, crossover with Nailbiter. Or... Yes, in the new stuff. Yeah, um, that's like sixty issues from from where this from where that a, starts. Yeah, yeah. Can, can I say that? And Army of Darkness. She that, has a Army of Darkness crossover ridiculous. as well. Good um, times. And I, yeah, that's the only reason I bring that up is not because you're wrong, but because like there's also magic and supernatural yeah. stuff involved in the series, and that's some of my favorite part. Yeah. So. Also, I love um, magic. I love her costumes in it um, because they are absurd. They are like bikinis and fishnets and tiny. Shirts. She dresses up like a sexy girl to attract murderers because murderers always go after sexy girls. Mm-hmm. As we learned from 80s movies. And uh, sexual activity attracts them like a shark to blood. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) These campers in this campground. In these sleeping bags. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that that is my pitch. I I know this is a complete aside, but uh, I think the only uh, Friday the 13th movie that I've ever seen is Jason X. Which is the science fiction one where they're on a totally spaceship. the best one. No. Well, it's my favorite one. Because <laughs> at one point he it. goes on to a holodeck. Yeah, this is the part there's a recreation of these like two sexy girls in sleeping bags. Yeah. And they're like, we're going to have unprotected <laughs> sex. So they're trying to attract Jason yeah, to the holodeck. They're, yeah, they're trying to dr- get him in there and like distract him. <laughs> And like it cuts away to the everybody else, and it cuts back, and he's just got one of the girls in a sleeping bag, and he's like beating her against a tree. <laughs> It's, it's hilarious. Pretty, pretty because it's awful, just like but... within this movie, it is yeah. such a parody of those movies. Yeah, because he gets to the holodeck and there's like a sign for Camp Crystal Lake, which is where like the first yeah four or five of them took place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got um, to. Sorry, complete aside. Yeah, that's just my pitch for everybody go watch Jason X because that movie is amazing. Well, okay, mm. I say do, but only if you're watching all like twelve of them in order. No, just uh, that one because you just like your mind just starts to melt into goo. And by the time you get Jason X, you're like, well, okay, I guess. And then you watch Friday, <laughs> Freddy versus Jason and you're like, wow, this looks like an Oscar like, winner. After the last I part. don't have any standards anymore. <laughs> those are yeah. I don't know only, why like, I ever I've had seen standards. Jason X and Freddy versus Jason. And those are the only one of either of those movies I've ever seen. A friend of the show, Frank Satilli, when I first moved into the apartment that he lived in, he had all of them. And so I spent like a week watching everyone <laughs> and literally, by the time you get to Freddy vs. Jason, your mind is mush to the fact where you're like, this is great. I'm loving this. I, love <laughs> I watched seven Friday the 13th films over the course of one evening. Oh my God. After How'd moving to Washington, I um, didn't have unprotected sex. There you go. That's yeah, how yeah. I lived Lesson through learned. it. Um, no, I actually just one night, I was like, I don't have any fucking control of my life. So I had to sit down and just watch these. And I remember uh, I remember my friend coming downstairs and being like, Christ, Kit, what did you do? And I'm just sitting there with all these blankets. Like, I don't understand why anyone watches these movies. They're not scary. They're not, I don't, I'm going to watch them again. And she's like, no, you just need to get up. You've been here too long. I love the first three. That's what I'll say. I've I mean, they're not good bits either, and pieces but... Of each one, I think. Bits and pieces. <laughs> oh. Oh. No. Okay. Super spoopy Halloween. Too spoopy. So, Kit, what would yes. you like to pitch this week? I would like to wash my brain <laughs> in the beautiful, beautiful watercolors of this book. Something soft and sweet and less pointy. Um, I would like us to do Black Orchid, um, specifically the early 90s reimagining by Neil Gaiman and Dave McKean. Um, For those not in the nose, um, Black Orchid was uh, kind of a less known superhero at uh, one point, and Neil showed up along with a lot of other early British authors in the Vertigo line. And they did some reimagining. 
And that's how we got such things as Swamp Thing and, again, Sandman, which was going to be something else entirely. Dr. Fate, I think, was going to be Sandman. Um, and then they did this with Black Orchid, which uh, they went and took this character and gave her a backstory and gave her just this really beautiful, beautiful book. Um, so basically it starts by this this person being caught by a gang, um, kind of crime lord sort of people, and appears to be murdered. And what happens afterwards is kind of this uh, vaguely existential exploration adventure um, where she has to reconcile her human memories with this possibility that she is a demigoddess plant and figure out what happened uh, to kill her. And she is one of the rare characters that we throw into DC world, Vertigo world, that uh, part of this reimagining ties into the green with Swamp Thing. Yeah. So if you like Swamp Thing, um, you may enjoy this fun, breezy, beautiful cover girl watercolor book. Um, yes. And it's a, it was a short Series, yeah. right? What, like what I'm pitching issues? is specifically the uh, Neil and Dave portion that kicked off what later became a series with Vertigo. Mm. It's only, yeah, six issues. Um, I think they just did another reprint of it, if I remember right. Um, otherwise, I have a copy that every now and again I pick up, cry, and drool over it and <laughs> sob on my floor saying, why can't I do watercolors? Why fucking can't I do watercolors? And then I eat some popcorn and go to sleep. So. Fair a good coping mechanism yeah sleeping and popcorn it's one of my <laughs> so favorites. if anyone cares about my feelings this isn't emotional manipulation um and wants to <laughs> shove art into their eyes in a different sort of soft and beautiful way what if we don't care about your feelings but want to read the book anyway um i wouldn't say that that's possible <laughs> but um, if it were in fact possible, hypothetically, then you would be making the right choice. Okay, and there would be a couple limbs that wouldn't be on the ground. The way that you said that, I thought you were going to say there was going to be a cupcake. I was probably going to say that. I was hoping I you were going to say a couple of dollars sliding your way. And I was um, like, no bribing on the well, show. Well, see, again, we, we podcasting is a visual. As a rule. Podcasting is a visual true. medium. Yeah. So clearly, they saw me handing all these dollar bills to right. all of you. Yeah. To to all of our listeners out there, bribes are one hundred percent acceptable. No, they're not. That's not not. Why accurate. do you think we hand books to each other while we're pitching? They're full of dollars. So. Uh, you get, was, none of this money has ever made it why, my way. This is why <laughs> I'm. That's we don't pick your books that often. Maybe. Actually, I think we, we pick your books most yeah, often. Yeah, mine are the most picked, I think, just because I've been on the show for the longest, but whatever. Haley feeds me things, and then I do what she says. So, yes, there is bribery. Yep. That's Potatoes. fair. That's fair. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Is it count as ipso facto if you render the bribe, like, beforehand? I don't know. It's like, that. here's the thing, and then maybe do this other thing later. I mean, like a suggestion. Yeah. Like a, oh, That's here's called a implied reciprocity May, is what that is. Maybe a vote later. The yeah. maybe that. Oh, I don't know. Hey, I mean, hey Kate, you were over at my house yesterday, and I we was. made you a very lovely dinner. Uh-huh. I ate most of the potatoes on the tray. Yeah. So, uh, Chard, <laughs> what would you like to pitch this So, uh, trudging out of the 80s wormhole that I've dug myself into in the last month, uh, moving forward into the 90s, um, <laughs> after Vertigo had kind of gotten established, I'm pitching a Vertigo book, no spoilers. Um, oh, that's right. Uh, after Vertigo kind of got established, they all a bunch of the writers all got together for like a writer's retreat, which is something that most comic book companies do, but was really weird for Vertigo because they didn't really have a lot in common. Like the, the There wasn't like a line-wide... Um, kind of directive that they were working under. And so they, a lot of the books didn't really follow any of the same kind of, uh, ideas or themes or anything. They just, it just happened to be a lot of books about magic, uh, where the line wasn't outright explicitly. They were not told to do that. I think it just kind of like organically happened. So they got together and they were kind of like joking about the one thing that all their books had in common, which was they all had kid characters. Um, and that even though kids were not present in comic books for kids. Comic books for mature readers tended to have kids in them, and that's kind of odd. So they chose to write a Vertigo crossover. Um, Mm -hmm. In the tradition of Vertigo, however, it was neither well-planned nor, 
like well collected or organized. Uh, so they wrote two issues. Neil Gaiman wrote two issues. He wrote, they, I think they were prestige size, but uh, they were called The Children's Crusade 1 and 2. And uh, they were the beginning of a story and the end of a story. And the middle of that story was then spread out amongst all these other writers and artists and kind of published in all these other titles, which Kit has, I think, almost mm-hmm. every single single issue of those. We were Kit talking about went this on the other a day. mission for yeah. three years. Yeah, to get all those. So, yeah. <laughs> Not easy to find all those issues is, I guess, what I should say. But they included the characters from um, Animal Man as in Animal Man's Daughter. They included characters from Sandman in the Dead Boy Detective Agency. They included Tim Hunter from Books of Magic. A.K.A. Uh, pre-Harry Potter. B- Harry, Whoosh. Yeah. The real Harry Potter, a.k.a. He's Baby Potter. He, I call him Proto Potter. Kaylee, look at this kid. Like, that's fucking Harry Potter right there. He'll uh, be JK by 10 fair. years, but and he's too gracious he to say so. Does he actually have a lightning bolt scar? No. No, he, he does okay. have a pet owl, He has a pet though. owl, he wears glasses, and he's the most powerful wizard in the world, and, and the chosen one. And he's a British one. kid. And, and he's British, yeah. and he has messy hair, and he's kind of a loner. He does and he has skateboard. a chick friend who's way too smart for her own yeah. good. And he skateboards because he's a fucking badass. Yeah, he's got sneakers. <laughs> well, it was the 90s. Uh, it was the 80s, actually, when Tim 80s. Hunter was invented. Yeah. Uh, and he's awesome, but he, he totally is like the Harry Potter. I want to do Books before. of Magic for a long run I want to do that, guys. too. Jesus Christ. Yeah, I would love to do that. But this is a great introduction to all of these characters, even if you've never read any of those series, which is why I'm pitching it. And recently they recollected it as... Free Country, A Tale of the Children's Crusade, in which they went back and took Neil Gaiman's beginning and ending and wrote a new middle to. Oh, my God. Which is yeah. super weird, but really yeah. good. And uh, the middle's great, and I just reread it, and I really liked it. And I I think it's the only way you should read it, collected now, because the other way is... Legendary Im- difficult to read. Yeah, and nearly like, impossible to find. Yeah, it's there is a purple Tupperware in my house that is closely guarded. <laughs> yeah. Um, so a, a, this yeah. this story uh, starts out with the Dead Boy Detective Agency, and they get a case, and an entire town's worth of children are missing. And uh, they go on the case, and they find out it's more than just simple child kidnapping. There, There's stuff afoot, and they have to go gather up these champions of magic, and which are all these kids, and go on a crazy mystic magic adventure. It's and in awesome. Neil, and Neil tradition, um, classic Neil tradition, he was interested in it, it uh, inspired by the actual Children's Crusade right. as well. So there's which some really there's, fun yeah. beef to that story. Yeah, which if you don't know, the Children's Crusade is where everybody was like, yeah, we got to go fight off this, uh, you know, this incursion into our holy land. Mm-hmm. Uh but we've lost like the last three or four. I think the Children's Crusade is like number five or four or five. I, yeah. My history is a little off. But um, this priest basically was like, you know, you know why we can't win is because we're not pure because we're adults and we're we've been corrupted Purity by the world. So let's send an army of children <laughs> yeah. to the Holy Land. It, I mean, like I'm laughing, but this is like one of the worst thing that's ever happened. One of the greatest. Like twenty thousand or like a crazy amount of children all left for the Holy Land. Almost none of them arrived uh, due to many circumstances, uh, and then they all died there. No one ever came home. Yeah. And it was a horrible, horrible thing. And uh, there's also references to, like, the Pied Piper and all these times in which children have kind of been abused and kidnapped and taken from their home. And so it's it's a beautiful story, and I love it. And it just got reprinted in a great hardcover from Vertigo, so everyone should go check it out. It is only twenty four ninety nine. Buy it with money. <laughs> Oh my god. From stores. You guys have all pitched yeah. such happy and uplifting Yeah, books. right? <laughs> I feel completely screwed here, actually, <laughs> in this situation. I told you what I was bringing you, you forgot. Well, yeah, but I, it's not my fault I failed to remember. <laughs> That's that fair, I, I say forgot. that all the time. <laughs> That's totally an excuse I would use. Man. Toby, you're up first, though. Yeah, I know. Um, all that pressure. Man. Jeez, Can't stop Wolf, I I don't know. Uh, I I guess I'm gonna vote for for free country. All right, Kaylee. I really, really, really want to read Friends with Boys, but I really want to read. Ugh, fuck. I'm gonna vote for Friends with Boys because I've brought it and I really want to talk about Stick it. Stick to your guns. Good yeah. call. Yeah. Do you realize there's four of us and this causes a problem, right? That's why I always bring the tie. 
This is what we did for a long time before we had yeah, five. Yeah, we, we have so mechanisms in. I'll place. make sure that we don't. Okay, end up but with a you're going to be breaking the tie on your own book because I forgot that you were bringing that, and I'm not going to not read free well, country. If, if you vote for it, it'll be two for free country and one for friends with boys, and then Chard can vote for anything but friends with boys. No, that's, because we have a voting mechanism in place. That's only true. if we so have I'm saying well five. It, yeah. Well, I mean, we could do it with four. It doesn't work with four. I don't know. Well, <laughs> uh, you can't vote for what you want. Yeah, that's we'll what make, I was, okay, that's yeah, what I was saying is this? that I forgot you were bringing oh, okay. this book, and I had an idea of what I wanted to read, and then I forgot about that, and then the memories came flooding back <laughs> of all those nights hunting for individual issues to complete this story, and I feel so incredibly fondly about this. So, yep. Free country. All right. All right. Sorry. And, uh, what, would, gonna... what would you like to vote for? Hackslash. I've brought it like twice. Okay. I'm a big fan of that book. I want everyone to read it. It has its problems. It's got its issues. It's got stuff. I think that it becomes something fantastic, though. Uh, I love the series as it is now. Uh, when it came back with a new writing team and a new art team uh, as Hackslash uh, Sons of Sam Hain, I think the series is the best it's ever been. So start at the beginning. Good deal. Everybody should check out Hackslash. But for next week... Uh, we are reading Free Country, A Tale of the Children's Crusade by Neil Gaiman and many, many others. There's like 40 names on the front of this book. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, from All Vertigo. Right. Well, thank you for listening, everybody. Yes. And we will see you next week. Yes. And also on our bonus series, Tales from the Gutters. Yes. Um... Which is our special Halloween spooky comic series. It's going to be running all October long. Yeah, so. on Fridays. Yes. So this will go out before... Episode 3. Episode 3. So episode what are you covering will have on gone up. 3? What are you covering um, on episode 3? On episode 3, we will be covering uh, foreign horror comics. Horror comics. Yes. Yeah, horror. 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 <laughs> horror. If you will. <laughs> yeah. The beautiful, beautiful world of... Junji Ito. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So stay tuned for that, and uh, we'll catch you all next time. Bye, everybody. Bye, and keep reading Elephant Men. That's coming up. Yeah. In the future. Yes. In the near November, future. November, probably. Yeah, a few weeks. Yeah. Soon. Yes. Uh, bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you for listening to me from the gutters. I hope our recommendations have inspired you to go out and find some new comics you'll enjoy. Join us next time for a discussion of our selected title. But like every week, we encourage you to read all of the recommended books. In the meantime, please leave us an iTunes read. It really does help new listeners find the show. You can also like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube, and follow us on Twitter at ViewFRTHGutters. Feel free to email us at contact at ViewFromTheGutters.com. Please send us any questions, comments, or recommendations you might have. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel as we post new videos every week. And thanks again for listening. And as always, keep reading.